are these people? So speaking of saying so in the chat mentioned, oh, we live in modern <laughs> hell, and that's the you know, orca. This is an example of that. Uh, great segue to that. So we see this, well, you'll see the full print later, but a partial print of an uh, ad, not an ad, but a print that you've probably seen of Kamala online or maybe in a magazine. In, like, And the, below that is like uh, joy. Uh, I forgot what it is right now, but like, but she, the, it, but this idea of joy, like that's the, you know, the way that Obama signified hope and change during his 2008 election. Kamala, for some whatever reason, it, it, it exemplifies joy. Okay. Yeah. Um. So, so what we're going to do tonight, and this might be a lo slightly longer segment, but I think it's worth it in this case. Uh, we're going to analyze this artwork. And as a teacher, even for five-year-olds, I do that sometimes. Uh, the idea of showing art, having them take a look at it for a few seconds, what we see, like, and what do you think is going on? Tell me a story of what you think is happening and having them cue in their perspectives of what they think is happening within the art. So, but even noticing the little details can tell you something in terms of what the art might be representing, but also how you might be programmed to think of things in a certain mm. way. And that's what we're kind of getting into. So I think this is so actually T.L. Orca uh, said 1960s call, called hold on to that because yeah. you're, we're going to talk right into that. Um, so this is a consortium news article Richard, written by Patrick Lawrence who titles Vote Joy, A Delusion of Nostalgia. Those populating the vice president's joy and vibes crowd can pretend to celebrate a state of elation while acquiescing to their candidate's approval of mass murder. I think this is kind of appropriate to read given the debate last night. So let's get into it. Um, many commenters have attempted to describe the astonishing uh, devolution of Democratic Party politics into sheer marketing. Yep. Kamala Harris as product, new and improved, like a laundry detergent or frozen dinner. Said the same thing uh, yesterday. Friend show, yeah, friend of the show, Vanessa Billy calls it cartoon theatrics. And it's good as I've seen. In two words, the British journalist captures from, from a useful distance the infantilism of the Harris for President campaign and the Hollywoodization of American politics. I mean, as I've said, politics is one step close to entertainment. Uh, we definitely saw that last night. I thought I've seen everything in this line until a few days ago, but in this, the most unserious political season in, of my lifetime, it is incautious to make any such assumption. There is always more something worse, another step down into a sort of political nihilism that leads the electorate stupefied as the Imperium conducts its violent, illegal business. A truly vulgar graphic artist named Key Arends now gives us a Kamala Harris campaign poster that is a beyond belief case in point. This is Kamala against a pastel field, no surname necessary, the presidential candidate as a striding figure out in a 1960s counterculture, a heroic hippie. I hope you're ready for the tagline. It is Vote Joy 2024. My so, mind was on other things when I first. Go ahead. No, finish, uh, and we'll talk about the art. Um... Okay. My mind was on other things when I first came across this poster, and it landed abruptly as an assault and an insult all at once. Just glance at it for now. This is how some Democratic voters, and I suspect many, want to imagine a candidate who supports and advances among various other late imperial crimes, a genocide of world historical significance. Go ahead. So, A, let's, let's, let's do more than just glance at it, as I'm sure we'll do in a bit, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, Kamala, first and foremost, right? Not her last name, correct? There's been talks about why it's correct. not her last name, right? Because it doesn't sound as exotic. Right. Right. 
like that's a like the, keep okay first of all when we look at art everything is a decision art is not made yes. accidentally unless you're jackson pollock and even yeah. that the accident is on purpose okay purpose. so <laughs> <laughs> like this is all alluding to like 60s mu uh, music posters, right? That's the other thing with art. We're on the shoulders of giants with all this, right? So type font, which is a whole subject in art itself, right? No, and shout out like Derek Sung, who is a friend of mine who actually created my Kamala Wukwano. Um, yeah, like that's my personal channel, but he created like, and that's something he talked to me about when he was designing. Like, yeah, even the font of what you use, yeah, fonts uh, are like massive parts of it, you know. Oh, so, yeah, well, and, and you're all trying to convey you convey things, you, you want the person looking at it to see the thing, so very flower powery, very good vibes. You know, all that stuff. Uh, like, I'm sure you could match it well, almost. Yeah, peace. Yes. Well, all those things. Even though this person exemplifies none of those things. None of that. Right. So, <laughs> like, that's part of the problem. And I, and I said it yesterday. I, to me, this entire election cycle has been marketing. It's Pepsi versus Coca-Cola. Yes. Like... Both yeah. of them have the same insides, arguably. You know, one might have more corn syrup than the other. They're still terrible for you, and you should drink water instead, unless it has lead in it. Sorry, Flint. But, you know, <laughs> um, how it goes. You know, I'm sure you're not the only one. Uh, like, uh, I, I look, Nestle's got problems too. Don't worry about it. Like, we're, we're all over the place. Um, but... Yeah, I just, it's very, and it's very new age sort of thing too, which I've got my own problems with. And because to me, all of that is empty, vapid rhetorical nonsense. You know what I mean? As much as horoscopes or any other religion, like, mm -hmm. you know, don't get me started on Carl Jung. I, I don't even want, you're going to have a bad time if you want to argue with me on it. It's not going to be fun. So, right. But yeah, I mean, this is very, all, it's all, it's all of that, you know, like very reminiscent yeah. of those things, you know, it's, yeah, it's very tune in, drop out, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, but yeah, anyway, I'm sure there's more to this. Let's get into this. Little, yeah, there's definitely more, uh, but you're kind of spot on with what um, Patrick was saying, but we'll continue. Yeah. There's always more, something where, oh, I read that. So, um, Kia Renz makes his living doing pop art graphics. That's him in the picture. Yes, sir. Logos and such. For a lot of show business people and credit Saturday morning children's television as his primary inspiration. Out in California, he owns and runs the La La Land Gallery, which seems about right. Yeah. Kia Renz seems to take this stuff very seriously indeed. And it goes this way. Eva Kia Rens has overestimated the gullibility, self-delusions, and unconsciousness of liberal voters, especially those who consider themselves progressive or left, or if I or I have underestimated the same. Now, Team Orca in the chat, um, most of 2017, I was engaged with conversations about CIA art projects. Let me tell you, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, that the, the whole thing that this art is alluding to is covered in CIA manipulation in that field. In the music, in the artwork, in the pop art, in the all of it. Like go, go Velvet Underground, all that stuff, all connected. Like you, you think the CIA would let a, the giant influence of art and music and movies not be propaganda for children? Like you might have a couple slip right. through, but they end up figuring it out and then you never hear from them again. So, right, uh, you know, so it's just the way it goes. Like it is a massive propaganda. You know, same thing in the so they accuse the Soviet Union of doing right. You know, all that propaganda posters, which are gorgeous, by the way. 
amazing art over there, amazing animation over there. Like, but yet, you know, it was all propaganda from dictator rulers. Like, we don't have that here. We just do it a little sneakier, you know? So, anyway, continue. Sure. I fear key errands may have me on this one. People are really excited about this poster, he said in a brief video interview after giving away copies of it at the DNC. People are emo connected emotionally to my art. When I first saw the Kamala poster, it was via social media message, Katrina Vanden Heuvelen, Heuvel? I guess. Heuvel, I guess, sent out with cheerful approval on X. Twitter. Vanden Heuvel, yeah. Vanden Heuvelen, Heuvel, as many readers will know, is the editorial director of The Nation. Oh. It is important to take note. In Vote Joy 24, we find the development Denouement. of the long, pitiful story of, yeah, of what has become the American left and why this term now requires quotation marks. I've long thought politics can be usefully read as an expression of antecedent cultural and psychological phenomena. Yeah. Um, this is how I view the key Arendt's poster and why I think it merits careful scrutiny. It is a window, or maybe a Rosetta Stone, in which we can read the coded entirety of the left's psychic journey from the honorable commitments of earlier times to, to what? To a state of willfully, willful political and Im intellectual immaturity. Yeah. Now study the poster for a good few minutes. We kind of did already. Yep. And you kind of mentioned this earlier. There is Harris, of course, in her standard pantsuit and pearls, the political candidate with whom we are familiar. She is serious and altogether credible, but where's that fun, have, but, but where's that having fun sorority sister smile that endears her to many Democratic voters? Yeah. There are flowers splashed around the whole of the graphic. These are essential to the overall fact. They are the kind of flowers you see on the walls of grade school art classes. And now they are flower power flowers. They bathe Harris in an aesthetic of innocence with a subliminal suggestion of a childlike guiltlessness. Note Harris' stride is in this connection. It is purposeful, but with an air of a carefree right. girl walking in the garden. When you see her in other and artwork, tit it's titled Forward, right? You know? Right. Yeah. And then the typefaces. The joy, Vote Joy 2024 in the lower right immediately draws the eye. It is subtly but unmistakably a reference to the posters associated with the late 60s rock scene, a variation on psychedelic Fillmore West and psychedelic Fillmore East, more East, which, believe it or not, are two recognized, recognized typefaces. Type I'll, I'll link at some point um, the like history of type font, right? If you put that into Google, it'll probably be the first thing that comes up in YouTube, right? It talks about literally this as an entire era Right. Then we start heading into like the uh, 70s, NASA, all that stuff. Right. Where we get really weird graphical design stuff yeah. out of that. Right. But this era is like pulling from bohemian typefaces and uh, it's doing a yeah. lot. It's a lot of stuff going on at the time. Uh, and I mean, Eastern was, culture was stuff, too. Both. Right. Right. Uh, I, I watched the uh -huh. other day, not to get too derailed, but I wanted to mention it because they talked about it a second ago, um, where they are, who are they trying to manipulate with this, right? It is not the, like, what, what, it, what was the term used? Right. It's, it's not the, like, mature intellectual. Right, who sees through this marketing? It's. I, I mean, I wouldn't call myself that in this case, but like. Right. But no, but it, actually, I did have thought about this today because going off of the debate. Yeah. It, like the question I was thinking, who was the debate for? It's yeah. not for us. No, it's for the it's dumbs. It's not for the. It's not for the right. It's not for the Democratic hardheads who will vote for Kamala regardless. It's, it's also. I want if you to keep you, in mind. The level of depression in the country, right? Where people are are so they need 
a, a beacon of hope, right? It's why Obama ran on that, right? We've not fundamentally changed any of that. So that hope poster, right, which they tried to give Kamala one too for forward, right? It's like right. the same sort of thing of it's, it's the people who are, are have put right. their head in the sand because they are tired of hearing the depressing world we live in. And now they've decided when they turn on the TV, they see this giggly, vapid lady who seems nice. She's nice. You know, like that's all. She's right. the lady that brings these people their coffee in the morning. Like they're not seeing it past that. Right. Like, right. Just as a person, they like her more than they like the other guy. That's about it. And it's vice versa on the other side, by the way. Like, you know, they, they don't think of Trump for all of his policies or anything that he does. It's just his outward appearance, which is like people they know. They know people like that. Mm -hmm. They know that kind of asshole that you kind of like, but says things that are a little ridiculous. You know, like that's what it is but anyway um yeah just marketing um <laughs> kia Renz has added a couple of small touches i must mention for the sheer fun of them he has inscribed a faint paisley pattern into harris's presidential pantsuit paisley dwell yep. upon paisley for a sec and see what you think this means and beneath the pantsuit he has kamala harris wearing canvas sneakers those flimsy, flat, converse things favored by young people who are, to put it charitably, casually dressed. Sheer fun, and if you think about it, a very pure case of pointedly manipulated imagery. If I were a certain type of kind of columnist, I would say the poster Kian Renz has made to express his enthusiasm for the Harris campaign, which he now sells for $47, extra for framing, is just was as was just shouted to me from across the room a complete mind fuck yeah it's what they want it to be not what it is right. but i'm not but i'm not that kind of columnist i will not say this poster with all of its flower power icon iconography in behalf of a warmonger is a complete mind fuck i would say that psychologically ambitious intent of this poster is to perform an act of love on a cerebral cavity way more acceptable for family publications such as Christonium News. I do not know whether the Harris campaign commissioned this. I don't think they did. I suspect they like it well enough, but did not order it up. In the video interview mentioned above, Kia Renz comes ov over as an averagely guiltless, averagely indoctrinated <laughs> liberal with no clue of the diabolical cynicism in which the Democratic Party is inventing Kamala Harris of whole cloth. <laughs> My read, vote, 20, vote Joy 2024 comes straight out of Key Arance's unconsciousness, and this is what makes it interesting. <laughs> it is fair enough and useful if we think of Arance as the ID, as the id, id of those progressive and left inclined voters the Harris campaign must seduce if Kamala is to win in November. My 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 Jungian senses are are voters. tingling. You're using outdated Jungian stuff, but <laughs> I feel you. Not quite okay. what you think it is. That unconscious thing isn't what you think it is. Not how it works. I do not. I do not know how many Democratic voters buy into the various significers Arans has inscribed into his poster. I suspect he speaks for very many. Someone should check his sales. But let us set this aside. His work is certainly a disturbing measure of the extent to which those who, well, who could well propel Harris to the White House in November are prepared to delude themselves into seeing things in Kamala Harris that are simply not there, Yeah, which you mentioned earlier. Yep. My art is supposed to reflect positivity, hope, and joy, Aran said in the video interview. There are a lot of Democrats looking for just these things in the figure of Kamala Harris. But this is not the remark of an aware or self-aware American in the late summer of 2024. It is the remark of someone who is determined, determinedly neither. As an aesthetic object, the Arendt's poster is crude, but this is of no matter. It is dense with, very, with many layered significers, 
and these are what matter. There are important insights to be gained as we examine these layers and discover what, taken together, they have to say about the long regression at the left hand end of Americans' politics about liberal and left voters' fears, fantasies, and failures of nerve. Here is the Britannica definition of flower power. It is a good place to begin. Flower power, the belief that war is wrong and that people should love each other and lead peaceful lives, used especially to refer to the beliefs and culture of the young people called hippies in the 1960s and 70s. Instantly, we learned something. We've heard daily talk of joy and vibes since the Democratic Party elites and donors undemocratically imposed Kamala Harris as their 2024 candidate. And now we find, via an admittedly goofy but probably representative Harris voter with the amateur gift of social psychology, that beneath this compulsive positivity, there seems to lie a strong streak of nostalgia. Why, the obvious question, do the liberal voters for whom Arendt speaks, or to whom he speaks, or both, indulge in nostalgia for a time they never knew? Why is it important that they identify so strongly with those who politically, with those whose political and cultural commitments, however gauzily recalled, gave the 1960s a reputation the decade has in the public consciousness? Why the historical reference? Answer this and we can see into the strange dynamic driving the wave of enthusiasm for the Harris campaign as it floats along fluffy clouds of joy and good vibes. Nostalgia, I've long argued, is at the bottom, is at bottom a symptom of depression. I'm, Nostalgia yep. of those who retreat into the past as a refuge from a present they find in one way or another unbearable. Mm -hmm. and, here I, and here I offer a corollary thought. The sensation of powerlessness is a primary cause of depression. Any good psychiatrist would confirm this. Yep. With this in mind, Think about all those people connecting emotionally to Kieran's iconography, and then all the others who may not have seen it, but would similarly identify with it. That these people are in some incoherent way nostalgic is beyond argument. The follow-on conclusion seems to me equally evident. All the talk of joy and vibes is at the bottom is at bottom a mask of a more or less prevalent depression people cannot admit to themselves they suffer. As the Britannica notes in this stuffy, wooded fashion, peace and love were among the totemic terms that characterized the 1960s counterculture errands on subtly references. But you cannot, plain and simple, walk around today talking of either and expect to be taken seriously. Ours is not a polity that gives any cre credit credence to notions of peace and neighborly love. This is absolutely out. Propagandists and ideologues have long since transformed mainstream American culture yeah. since the Reagan years, I would yeah. say, into a culture of war and animus. Which Reagan's so big thing was like, you know, a new day, which was directly trying to market to hippies and, you know, all that stuff. It was the same thing back then. It's all any of these elections are. Right. Uh, and so we return to joy and vibe. These are excellent terms for those given to fantastic readings of Kamala Harris. To stand for peace and love 50 or 60 years ago was to challenge what people used to call the establishment. The man, they man. Meaning. They had meanings, however, angelic those were professing these things. Joy and vibes have no feeling. No meaning, sorry. That is, this is why they have caught on like fires in a dry forest. They do not signify challenges to anything. They license an extraordinary flinch from everything. Everything. American participation in the genocide, the proxy war in Ukraine, the incessant and increasingly dangerous provocations of China, the brutalization sanctions against Iran, Venezuela, Syria, Cuba, and all such serious matters of policy. There is no need to think about any of this. There is indeed an unwritten code that the crisis of our time, American leaders responsible for all of them, 
are neither to be thought about nor mentioned. It is brilliant, I would say, the mutil mutilation of logic and reasoning. There is something for everyone in it. For the Harris campaign, the childish nonsense of joy and vibes is a diabolical and effective blind. Behind it, Harris's people, and Kamala Harris is nothing more than the sum total of her advisors, can commit to the Imperium's foreign policies without the bother of public scrutiny. Just leave all of that to us. This is a message the Harris people have, have as they flatly refuse to take up any of the questions that matter most to the Imperium citizens. And for those who subscribe to the Joy and Vibe ethos, from Katrina Van Heulen on down, this is a twofer. They can persuade themselves they will stand against the established order by voting for the established order. Tell me you know anyone who has deceived themselves, himself or herself, so cleverly as this. A while arranging the wilted flowers in their hair, those populating the joy and vibes crowd can pretend to celebrate a statue of a state of elation while acquiescing to the candidate's approval of mass murder. This is important to these people, but they must at all costs avoid facing their utter powerlessness and so their subliminal depression as they succumb once more to voting for an evil, it is a stretch to consider the lesser of anything. One question lingers as I glance again at the key Iran's poster. What under the sun happened to the American left between its years at the barricades in the service of honorable causes and this? It's time for meek-minded gutlessness. When did it pass from left to quote-unquote left? There is a book in the answer to this, the interior history of several generations, but I will keep this brief. One of the remarkable features of the anti-war and anti-imperialist movements of the 60s and 70s, along with the principal feminists of those years, was the willingness of so many people to accept the necessity of sacrifice, sacrifice and risk, I would say. Um, such people understood if you cannot stand for what you think is right and accept all the consequences attaching to being authentically who you are, your thoughts and being are of no use. You understood the necessity of living beyond the fence posts, having concluded nothing of worth could get done within them if your intent was to work for genuine change. And so no one gave up well-paid employment or life in a good neighborhood or holidays along the coasts of Maine or whatever else comprised one's version of middle-class privilege. A certain precarity often accompanied these choices. Your car was a clunker. The heat pipes clanked. Gradually over the years, the energy and commitment, the commitment to committing, let's say, faded. I saw this in people younger than, than I as early as in mid-70s. People wanted to think of themselves as activists, as committed, as standing for change, as totemic word here, as movement. But careers came first. Yep. The thought took hold that one could get into worthy work done inside the fence posts and without taking any risks. Kia Rents is merely a product of this moment, not to be singled out as anything more. His poster is a cultural text. This is testimony to the vulgarization of American public discourse, but none it is, nonetheless, or it may be for this reason, bears interpretation. Among other things, the iconography icon of his poster reminds us that the Harris for President campaign is in considerable measure a psychological phenomenon. I read Vote Joy 2024 not as a celebration for the Harris for President project, but as an implicit admission for what is absent from it. It is a document recording, in the simplest terms, the regret for those who have refused the risk of not dying while envying those before them who took it. Um, so, so I want to kind of continue with this. So, Kate, I think you brought this to me too. Um, yeah. Maybe. Um, but yeah, so Kayla Johnson, who we love here, um, kind of adds to this thought, or what Patrick was saying, uh, where she tweets, I feel like I should reiterate my position that you're not actually punishing the Democrats by refusing to vote for them in November. They don't care if you don't vote for them. 
they don't care if they lose. Their political careers will be fine either way. It's entirely fine and legitimate not to vote for Democrats, but don't let that act dupe you into thinking your vote matters. It doesn't matter how you vote, and it doesn't matter what you don't vote. How you don't vote, sorry. The U.S. power structure is set up to be completely unaffected by voters. Acting like you could teach the Democrats a lesson by refusing to vote for them only feeds into the illusion that voting matters inside a power structure that has been deemed too important to be left to the hands of the voters. There's a viral, oops, there's a viral tweet from Glenn Greenwald going around that says, the U.S. has had no functional president and has not had one for months and is barely noticeable and barely matters because there's a permanent unelected machine that runs the government. Yeah. Greenwald is correct. Nobody with any real power cares that cares all that much who the president is. The president doesn't even need to have a functioning brain. This whole show is being run by people who don't ultimately care that much whether Democrats or Republicans are in office, including the party leadership of the Democrats and Republicans. You think Democrats have enjoyed playing the face of the evil empire these last few years? You think they've enjoyed having their political rallies interrupted by anti-genocide protesters and having their feel-good progressive image completely discredited in front of everyone? They'll all be having a lot of fun if the terrible things being perpetuated by the Biden administration were being done by Trump instead, so they can go back to playing the good guys. They're happy to lose, which is why they're acting like they're happy to lose. They're doing absolutely nothing to appeal to progressives or energize their base. They're not articulating any real policies besides more of the same. They're not changing anything about any of the things that make normal people hate Democrats in the year 2024. And if they lose again in November, they will continue to change anything. Americans don't live in the kind of country where votes matter. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Vote or don't vote however you want, but don't make the mistake of believing you will be teaching the Democrats any kind of lesson that they will actually learn by doing so. If real change comes to the United States, it won't be because of how Americans chose to vote or not vote in any of their fake elections. There are no solutions to these problems in electoral politics. Yep. Um, so, friend, to show Misty, yep. uh, add to this, it's all fake. It's like a soap opera with psychopaths. And it's obvious. And I wish people would stop living in a world of make-believe where voting matters. It doesn't. At all. So, oh. So I added this. This kind of connects. Um, mm. like, like, and I say this in terms of voting, like, being willing, not just giving you a vote freely, but the idea of, like, you know, you got to make them work for it if you want that work you yeah, want. Except, I mean, there's no, like, they don't, like Caitlin said, they don't care. Right. Like, either way, they get what they want. So, right. But either way, I said, if you're planning to vote for Kamala Harris, you should have the stance of being willing to vote, willing, in exchange for t political tangibles instead of getting your vote freely. This is now the time to get concessions, not after they get your vote. So I think you're right. And I think what Ken was saying was also correct. I think everyone was saying was also correct. But again, going back to the debate, like I know I was saying this earlier, but I was thinking, who was the debate for? It wasn't for us. And it's not for the Democrat loyalists. It's really for the undecided voters. Yeah. Who, which I would argue are probably more moderate because even in the clips I heard of Kamala, she sounded like very moderate. And so yeah. my thing is this. Well, look, as moderate as rabid Zionism and staunch anti-immigration and she sounded like a Republican. Right. Like, so which is exactly my point. So yeah. like my point is this. It's like and given what she reiterated in about Israel and Gaza, which yeah. I don't believe people believe that she's which, actually going to change anything or be any better. No, they do this like every Biden year. Trump, like, it, 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 it's like it's always funny to me where like the Democrats will, will 
scream to the ends of the earth, we got to stop the Republicans because they might do Republican things. Meanwhile, to them, they also think to beat the Republicans, you have to be better at Republican policies to get Republicans to vote for you. You right. like you can't have it both ways. You can't have like try to appeal to them, but then also talk about how they're going to ruin the country. Right. You know, but here's the thing. But here's the thing that I was thinking of this morning as I was getting ready to go to work. Yeah. For all intents and purposes, like basically right now, well, you can make the argument that Democrats are doing their best to lose, which is possible. But you can also make the argument that they're trying to win over doing really nothing. Yeah. So they think nothing is better than evil war. Right. But here's the thing with this like, you're making the gamble right now to appeal to moderate undecided voters, which I argue is very small number of people, over people who are more con concerned about issues like Gaza in particular, yeah. that has a much more diverse and larger base that you can pull from to actually do something right now. And not to say they need to vote for Kamala, but at least make the appeal. Like, or pretend to whatever you want to yeah. do. So you're willing to make that. So my argument is this, like if Kamala wins, like, okay, in the short term, you, not to say you got what you wanted, but you got what you wanted in the short term of having enough people kind of vote for you, I guess. Yeah. The kind Colin, of the illusion. But you long think? term, but, I, but I'm thinking more long term what the implications for the Democratic Party are. Yeah, because they've lost that base forever, and especially with this war in Gaza, if that continues, if Kamala is president, people are going to get more and more agitated. Like Patrick talked about the powerlessness, like people might actually start actually acting out on that powerlessness. I hope to God in the way they do. And that's when you're going to see more of the police state kind of come in. We're going to see more of that censorship kind of come in, more so that we're seeing now. So I think this is kind of like a perfect storm, but it's not going to look good for Democrats, I think, long term, if they're trying to appeal to the moderate vote versus people relatively on the left, whatever that means now, that actually care about these issues to some degree that they can make the case for. So, but you, yes, I could also see how they don't really give a shit because... Yeah, either way they get what they want. Want. So, um... So, I wanted to touch on uh, one thing in the article that I felt like was, was interesting because I was literally, like, writing it down before... It, you got so. Who do you think the biggest demographic is going to be for the Democratic in Party? Terms of, like in terms, in terms of, of voting, like suburban, like yeah, suburban white, generally people who they might be struggling, perhaps. Yeah, but they have the income and they're living fairly decently. That. What age? No matter what, their lives are not going to be affected all that much. If I what av average so, age you think? I would say like boomers, definitely. Uh, probably up to my age, like forties. Like, yeah. So, so I would say generally people who are established in their careers. So I'll say around late thirties, forties. Maybe with families, but generally those in the middle class who are doing okay. Like, so it talked about, you know, the boomers, right? Mm -hmm. Who became with politically the, aware. Yeah. Right. Right. So this is the era they're trying to allude to, but it, it talked about specifically, um, uh, you know, that like, where was it at? Um, so 
there there was a, a video and I'll, I'll try to find it at some point because it'll pertain at some point too but and i forget who was talking about it but it was like some artist right who was who was talking about why everything in the 80s became so like corporate mm-hmm. right and and partially it's like you see this whole thing about well paid employment right? right that 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 became too comfortable for these people what happened was essentially the creatives the people who actually gave a fuck about this stuff who were part of that counterculture right got assimilated into the workforce right so right. they were the creatives they felt strongly about political ideas and then they became part of marketing and tried to appeal to a broader audience and then those the people above them who were the man right left retired they right. ended up moving up the ladder and becoming part of that rat race right, right? and uh, it, you know they just got assimilated into that and I mean, you had it in the '80s too, but it it like. Well, but, but but what generation was that? that's the boomer? That's the boomer generation, right? The, who now was, have like, not right, let go of the jobs like, they have? Right, that was like the the hippies of the '60s. So they were probably like in their teens, twenties, to now yeah. at that point being like in their late thirties, forties. So this was kind of the age I kind and of it, started coming. And in. they become like, indi- they become indignant about it now, where it's like if you right. bring up anything about fighting the establishment or whatever they go well when i was a kid we did this and this and we got out and did this and that and it's like yeah we're doing that too too uh, but you guys actually got some concessions at some point right. you know we're not and it's partially right. because what, what what they do is they put people like kamala harris or obama or these people that could be these boomers kids for all they know right to where it's like the, uh, and they just make them generally appealing, mm-hmm. right? Where it's, it's these people have long since put the horse blinders on to focus on their families, to focus on themselves, right? And they've lost any of that anti establishmentness that they used to have. You know, they, the whole reason they were anti establishment to begin with was usually because they could afford a higher education because it costs them less to do that. So, you know, you go around there, you hang around with collegiate environments, you start listening to NPR, NPR starts lying to you, like, and makes you very comfortable with any of the wars we've been in, any of the foreign policy we've been a part of, right? And you just become complacent in that questioning that you used to question. All those institutions right. you used to question, you're now institutionalized. Like, so you right. don't question them. Like, right. and then you 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 take it personally when we bring up that's what's happened. Because like you still see yourself as like the joy and you know. But in turn, you've been complicit in the very thing that you would have been against as a kid, which is why this stuff works. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, I, I, I found this over the weekend and, and like given, again, as I said, given as a teacher, I kind of do some like our analysis with my kids sometimes, but I think just, I think honestly, like we don't think of art in this way. Like we can analyze it, and like even just I think, especially like as far as marketing things that we do use now, it's like I just think it's just so fascinating. Like the underlying, like things that we don't think about when we look at ads or whatever, but it's so intentional and it's so I know what I'll do crafted in a way to get you to think in a certain way or make you feel in a certain way that you don't even realize it a lot of the time it's just more or less again the idea of vibes like oh I like that or I don't like that but not knowing the psych- psycho- psychology as to there are actually things in place in a lot of this marketing that make you respond to things in a certain way so 
I just found that article, I think, kind of fascinating, but just mostly ripping into Kamala. But I think given the the debate last night, I think it definitely kind of relates. It's this idea of like, but, but that's what he speaks to. It's like people feel hopeless. Like they don't feel like they have any power. So it's this idea of the savior complex of like, here comes Kamala bringing in this hope and joy that you've been long waiting for. And getting excited over that, but over nothing tangible. Like, you know, like, shout out to Sam because I was listening to her before we came live. You know, she finally put up policy is issues, I would say. I wouldn't say really policies at all. But she talks about increasing the minimum wage. To what, though? Like, right. a cent? Like, yeah. Uh, what where's the like to what like it's just very vague it's just very vapid just like this print it's well, just meanwhile going off on feeling but versus actually anything of substance and that was the thing that frustrated me with the debate last night more people were talking about trump eating pets yeah or like <laughs> yeah, him yeah. Pet. and like but that's the thing it's like people were watching it for the shit that Trump was going to say or the mess that was going to go down versus taking away. I actually feel like if I was listening in the candidate, I was going to get something. It was just more or less the idea of like, what's Trump going to say? What Trump is going to do? How's Kamala going to respond? And like, they were looking for that drama instead of the actual policy. Yeah. And so that was the thing that yeah. really frustrated me. Like, was again like real, real housewives more, of the district more, of columbia the of the debate versus the actual tangibles yeah. from the debate so, that should have been the focus but we didn't get that compare and contrast that joy poster with real art made by people with real emotions who are feeling things very differently art like that like mm -hmm. palestinian artist Silman Mansour, right? And and I found this back in July, right? From this uh, local Twixing machine who posts Palestinian art almost exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, somehow art like this hits harder than pictures of the atrocities it's depicting. I think it's probably because I've been numb to seeing it. Um... But here I can feel the pain in every line and shadow looking at the gaunt dehumanized figures staring back at me speaks volumes like this is yeah. what they're experiencing. Uh, you know, and you're trying to find hope in an image you've made for yourself in Kamala Harris when in turn she's complicit in this. I, I don't know how you can square that circle. So, uh, you know, I, I think the only I issue think, is that thinking about that stuff breaks their illusion for them. Right. And That's the that hurts. Why, as a teacher, like, I encourage my kids to draw, even if they don't necessarily like it. But think they're good? Like, no, but it's like, no, you're, it, it doesn't have to be good. It's the idea of what are you trying to communicate. That That's their first... Like, as far as written communication, that's it's the also, first thing you do. For me, it's and one like, of those things with, with any of these arts, whether it's music, whether it's whatever, I, I take offense at the, you know, God-given talent thing. It's never that. Not one artist well, have I be, ever well, talked you to. Could be, you could be naturally good at it, but you still have to work Even then, it. even then, like, naturally good. Like, there is people who would claim... They are naturally good, who don't do any of the work necessary. When there's people right. who would claim they're bad and put in hours upon hours of work, like I don't care who it is. Natural talent isn't a, a thing in this, I don't think. You know, yes, some people spend more time and willing to spend more time on it, but that's what it is. It's time put in and you know, I think being good is a relative term when you can practice it being good. And then the rest of it's subjective anyway. So, right. you know, Jackson Pollock, arguably not that talented of an artist, yet his works go for 
crazy amounts of money. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I it's subjective. So take with it what you will. But yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm with you though. But yeah, I just that kind of stuff frustrates me to no end. That vapid yeah. rhetorical, no actual like substance Absolutely. argument. Yeah. Like right. it hurts my brain that people try to do that. But anyway. Long segment, um, but I think worth it. I think at least for the discussion alone was definitely especially since I know this is kind of in, in your wheelhouse somewhat. Yeah. So um so but let us know what you think about this print or generally you can talk about the debate or what you think about our political discourse right now in general. Like the fact that we're just our policy is an aesthetic versus actually meaningful policies that will actually not make people as powerless as they are right now. Like yep. I think definitely worth because you are or maybe mentioning in the comments and you know, and yeah, I'm just, we're just curious to know, like, how, what did you interpret, you know, within the print, if you were able to kind of look at it and really analyze uh, each element of it. Um, so yeah, you can scan, scan the QR code in, if you want to donate with your phone, or you can go to the link that you see at the bottom of your screen uh, and connect to us that way. Or if you're in the chat or YouTube, you can type in exclamation point donate and the link will pop up. You can also find the links of all of our uh, donation sites in our description in, in the stream. Uh, as we always say, YouTube hates us. That's why they dem de demonetized us. So any support we can give financially would be extremely helpful. Uh, and, you know, we are demonetized and YouTube doesn't like us. So the way we can try and combat that is by you liking and subscribing to the network. Uh, please share this clip or this stream uh, to help us fight the suppression. And make sure you leave a comment, especially with this topic, I think is kind of fascinating. So let us know what you're thinking. Uh, or if you want to just shoot off about the debate, that too, it's fine. And help us get to 3K. Uh, we're growing and we want to so we can bring more content like this. And thanks for watching.